unity in diversity. Now, in spite of all the diversities that we have seen so far, Indian community shares certain bonds of unity as well. And let's see how this has been possible, not now, but since time immemorial. Let's try and understand what we mean by unity first. Unity means integration. It is a social psychological condition and it connotes a sense of oneness, a sense of we feeling or we ness. It stands for the bonds which hold the members of a society together. But there is a difference between unity and uniformity. Uniformity presupposes similarity between the people, whereas unity does not. Unity is of two types. The first, which may be born out of uniformity, and the second, which may arise despite the differences amongst the people. French sociologist Emile Durkheim has termed these two types of unity as mechanical and organic solidarity, respectively. Mechanical solidarity is generally found in less advanced societies and is characterized by being based on the resemblance between the people, segmentation of the people into clans or territories, and ruling with repressive sanctions and prevalence of a penal law, highly religious and attaching supreme value to the society and interests of the society as a whole. Now, these societies do not give individual choice any place in their day-to-day goings-on. Organic solidarity, on the other hand, is generally found in more advanced societies and is based on the division of labor, characterized by the fusion of markets and the growth of cities which foster cosmopolitan attitudes amongst the people where there is a prevalence of cooperative and secular law and is human-oriented and attaches supreme value to the individual dignity, equality of opportunity and social justice. The societies characterized by organic solidarity are more inclusive and pluralistic societies. Now, what do we mean by pluralism? Pluralism recognizes diverse groups and seeks to provide a mechanism in which no one group dominates the state and in which all the interests of all the groups are reasonably taken care of. Pluralism is the diffusion of power amongst many special interest groups. It prevents any one group from gaining control of the government and using it to oppress the minorities and other people. When pluralism prevails in a society, no group can dominate. Pluralism is a mechanism through which unity in diversity is actually achieved. So there are many factors that contribute to unity in diversity. And when it comes to India more specifically, there are certain factors that played a very proactive role in fostering this unity. The first bond of unity, which is the geopolitical integration, is due to the geography bound by Himalayas in the north and oceans on the other three sides. Politically, India is now a sovereign state governed by one constitution, one administrative rule, executive, legislature and the judiciary. We have now a one nation, one tax also in the form of GST. We share the same political culture marked by the norms of democracy and secularism everywhere in our country. The expression of this consciousness of geopolitical unity of India are found in the Rig Veda, in the Sanskrit literature, in the edicts of Ashoka, in the Buddhist monuments, and in various other sources where we find the mention of the concept of Chakravarti or the emperor 
and the Eka Chhatradipatya, that means the whole country under the umbrella of one rule. Take the Vishnu Purana and it mentions India as follows. Uttaram yat samudrascha himadraschaiva dakshinam varsham tat bharatam nama bharati yatra santati. This is probably by far the oldest mention of India's geopolitical unity and geopolitical identity. And this Sanskrit verse, when translated into English, goes like this. The country, which is Varsham, that lies to the north of the ocean and the south of the snowy mountains, is called Bharatam. And there dwell the descendants of Bharata. Bharata may be a mythological character for all you know, but the fact that people who live in this part of the world are addressed as the descendants of Bharata and the children of Bharata, that means Bharata Santatihi, shows that India was egalitarian in nature and it considered all the people, irrespective of probably the racial affiliations that existed, or the social classes that existed as the children of Bharata. All the people of India have been identified as the dwellers of one single geopolitical entity called the Bharata Varsha. And that is how age old the concept of India's geopolitical identity is. Now the second bond of unity in India is the geocultural integration which is reflected in the network of shrines and sacred places, of temples, of mosques and churches, and the holy rivers that are spread across the length and breadth of India. From Kutch to Kamrup and from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, the religious shrines of all the religions in India are spread throughout the length and breadth of our nation. The Ajmer Sharif Dargah, the Golden Temple of Amritsa, the Tirupati Balaji, or the Velankani Church in Tamil Nadu, or the Buddhist monasteries in Ladakh, or the Jain temples everywhere, everyone visits them, irrespective of their religion and irrespective of their caste and class. It is the faith and the belief that matters, and religion never mattered actually for us Indians and we visit each other's temples of worship and giving equal respect to other people irrespective of the denominations to which we belong to. Now closely related to them is the age-old culture of pilgrimage which has always moved people to various parts of the country and fostered in them a sense of geocultural unity as well as being an expression of religious sentiment. They say that pilgrimage is also an expression of love for the motherland, a sort of mode of celebrating India itself. It has played a significant part in promoting interaction and cultural affinity amongst the people living in different parts of India. That's why you wouldn't be surprised when you see a Tamil or a Malayali speaking person in Varanasi and a Kashmiri speaking person in Kerala because that is how, you know, the different cultures of India have assimilated well into each other, coexist and find their expressions irrespective of the states to which they originally belonged. And this geocultural integration has acted as an antithesis to the regional diversity that otherwise prevails in our country. The Indian culture also has a remarkable quality of accommodation and tolerance. And there is an ample evidence of this. The very first evidence is the elastic character of Sanatana Dharma or the age-old traditions of the people of India, which is now called Hinduism. It is common knowledge that Hinduism is not a homogeneous religion. That is, it is not a religion having one God, one book and one temple. Indeed, it can be best described 
as a federation of faiths rather than a religion. Very polytheistic in nature, which we called as ultimate polytheism in paper 1. Hinduism goes to the extent of accommodating even the village level deities and also the tribal faiths. Anthropologist Robert Redfield has identified two broad forms of Hinduism. They are called the great traditions and little traditions. They are the Sanskritic and the non-Sanskritic forms of Hinduism respectively. On one hand, you have an orthodox Vedic culture and on the other, we have thousands of folk cultures across the country. And we shall be looking at this very interesting concept later on in detail in our discussions. Another evidence of the sense of accommodation and tolerance is its apathy to conversion because it is not a proselytizing religion. And these two characteristics of Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism have played an historical role in bringing in diversity while allowing people of all faiths and religions from across the world to make India their home and also fostering unity at the same time amongst the people. Another factor that fostered unity is that the Indian society was organized in such a way that the various social groups in the country, whether they are jatis or religious groups, were interdependent of each other. One manifestation of this is found in what we call as the Jajmani system, a system of functional interdependence of castes, a concept that we are going to see subsequently. The relations were traditionally between the food producing families and the families that supported them with goods and services. And the Jajmania system demonstrates a vertical unity of castes and families of other religions in rural India. A Hindu may be dependent for the washing of his clothes on a Muslim washerman. And similarly, a Muslim may be dependent for the stitching of his clothes on a Hindu tailor. Jajmania's system, which was elaborately studied by anthropologist William Weiser, stands as a great testimony to the concept of interdependence of caste and how the Indian civilization has survived in spite of so much of distinctions that existed because of the concepts of purity and pollution within the caste system. And we shall be looking at it anyway. And also the role of leaders and religious saints in forging unity amongst the communities. Take for example, Agba, who founded a new religion called Dine Ilahi, combining the best of Hindu and Islamic traditions. Bhakti saints like Kabir, Eknath and Guru Nanak, as well as some Sufi saints have made important contributions to promote unity amongst the communities. Adi Shankara's philosophy of Advaita was to bring about a unity within Hinduism because it was divided amongst the two camps of Vaishnavas and the Shaivas. Mahatma Gandhi in more recent times has laid extreme emphasis on the Hindu-Muslim unity which was instrumental in India becoming a secular state and moving on the path of progress. All these factors have helped in developing a composite culture in the country today that provided a model for the preservation and growth of plurality of cultures within the framework of an integrated nation. The above account of the unity of India should not be taken to mean that we have always had a smooth sailing in the matters of national unity with no incidents of caste, communal or linguistic riots. Nor should it be taken to mean that the divisive and the cessationist tendencies have been altogether absent. There have been communal riots, incidents of oppression and violence against the members of the scheduled castes, regionalism 
expressing itself time and again. And in extreme cases, separatist movements like in the case of Northeast. The redeeming feature, however, is that the bonds of unity in India have always emerged stronger than the forces of disintegration. Sir Herbert Risley once said that beneath the manifold diversity of physical and social type, language, custom and religion, which strikes the observer in India, there can still be discerned a certain underlying uniformity of life from the Himalayas to the Cape Comorin. Cape Comorin is the old name of Kanyakumari. There is in fact, he says, an Indian character, a general Indian personality, which we cannot resolve into its component elements. Probably, this is one of the most important features in India's unity in diversity. Irrespective of whether we are Kashmiris or Keralites, Kannadigas or Gujaratis, whether we are Hindu, Muslim or Christian, irrespective of a social class, all of us as Indians have a general personality, a common Indian character that cannot be resolved into its component elements. This is what Margaret Mead and other anthropologists have called the national character. And we Indians have a national character like the Japanese, for example, that irrespective of the background to which we belong to, irrespective of the levels of education, irrespective of whether we are religious or atheists, it doesn't matter. There are some characters which are uniquely Indian and that's the one that helps us get identified first as an Indian and subsequently as somebody else. The Rough Guide to India says, and I quote, It is impossible not to be astonished by India. Nowhere on earth does humanity present itself in such a dizzying, creative burst of cultures and religions, races and tongues. Every aspect of the country presents itself on a massive, exaggerated scale, worthy in comparison only to the mighty Himalayas that overshadow it. Perhaps the only thing more difficult than to be indifferent to India would be to describe or understand India completely. There are perhaps very few nations in the world with the enormous variety that India has to offer. Modern day India represents the largest democracy in the world with a seamless picture of unity in diversity unparalleled anywhere else. We shall be exploring the Indian society and culture in detail in this part of your syllabus, which is paper two. Paper two is anthropology of India or Indian anthropology, where we shall be exploring the nature of humanity in India and trying to understand the Indian culture and society with the help of our understanding of methods and concepts of anthropology we have learnt in paper one. Where the concepts are insufficient, anthropologists who were studying India developed their own theoretical models. We shall be emphasizing also on tribal India with special concern on their problems historically and also in the contemporary times. So with this curtain raiser to Indian society and culture, we will be moving on to the topics that are most specifically mentioned in your syllabus.